Olá, bem-vindas e bem-vindos. Um bom dia a todos. Eu sou Denise Barbosa e estamos aqui mais uma vez ao vivo do estúdio da McKinsey em São Paulo. McKinsey Talks já se consolidou como um espaço para conversas ao vivo com os maiores expertos do mundo sobre temas relevantes para a agenda de negócios. E hoje nós vamos falar sobre as 10 tecnologias que vão mudar as empresas e o mundo. Vale lembrar que vocês de casa podem participar fazendo perguntas durante toda a sessão, utilizando o campo que fica à direita, caso vocês estejam num computador, ou logo abaixo, caso vocês estejam de um telefone celular, por favor, participem, a participação de vocês é fundamental. Hoje a nossa sessão vai ser em inglês. Today we are joined by Rodney Zemo, Senior Partner and Global Leader of McKinsey Digital, based in New York. Good morning, Rodney. Good morning, it's a pleasure to be here. It's our pleasure. And Heitor Martins, Senior Partner and Leader of McKinsey Digital in Latin America, who is here by my side, based in Sao Paulo. Tudo bem, Heitor? Tudo bem, bom dia a todos. Good morning. Good morning, it's a great pleasure to be back here. It's our pleasure, let's start? Yes. Listen, we are all marveled with technology. We have our little mobile phones that have become our best friends and where we spend hours and hours every day. We do shopping over the internet and goods, ma goods magically appear in, the, in our doorsteps. We have watches that monitor our hearts. A lot of things that I could never Im have imagined that would happen. Huh? It feels like Star Trek. But what Rodney is telling us is that this is just beginning, and actually the pace of technology, te technological change is in fact going to accelerate over the next few years. Rodney, how did you get to that conclusion? How is that sure. research done? You didn't done? even mention it or the technology that allows me to join you today, even though I'm not able to fly there to meet you. So I'm sorry, I'm only uh, over the video. But we got to this conclusion at McKinsey. We put together a technology council that has 30 leading technology thinkers, academics, investors, commentators. And we conducted a survey of where companies and academia was, uh, was investing their money. We looked at patent filings and we looked at actual adoption of technology. And what we concluded from that is that the pace of change is going to be faster over the next 10 years than we've seen probably at any point in human history. And second of all, that there are 10 technologies or 10 clusters of technologies that we think are going to be the ones that are going to make a difference individually and collectively. Now, it's hard to make a prediction, particularly about the future, as the saying goes. So I know this is going to probably live on on YouTube for many years. So I'm sure you'll be able to have fun four or five years from now watching and seeing where we were wrong. And I'm sure we're going to be wrong in individual places. But collectively across this waterfront, we see tremendous and accelerating change. Is this like a new industrial revolution? I'm glad you said that, actually. If we go forward to uh, the, uh, the, the, ne the next uh, image that I brought along, let me try and put this in its historical context. Um, so I grew up in uh, Manchester in the UK, which really powered the light blue line on the top of this chart. And about 120 years before I was born, Manchester was the wealthiest city on earth. And that's because it was powered by that first industrial revolution. And that was really a cluster of technologies. It's important to remember it was a group of technologies over about probably a 50-year time period to get it going. It wasn't just about one spark. But what those technologies did was started a revolution that ultimately doubled or more GDP per person, so lifting many, many people out of poverty, transport, transforming the employment landscape, right, moving from the more than 50% of people who worked in agriculture then to the 10-ish or 10 to 15-ish percent that uh, work in agriculture today, and then creating a spread of those technologies around the world. That was transformational. This is bigger, a lot bigger, actually, we believe. And you can see the accelerating impact of the second industrial revolution, which was really the global spread of those technologies, or the third industrial revolution, which was really the early days of, uh, of computer power and the productivity gains that came with it. But we think what comes next is going to be bigger. So we're all very curious. What comes next? What are these 10 so threads? So here's the grand reveal then. <laughs> so let's talk about the 10 technologies that we think will change the world. And, and what I'll do is I'll just very quickly just um, highlight each of them here. And then I think we're going to click into a few to talk about them in more detail. So first of all is capturing distributed data from around the world from many devices to drive next level process automation and manufacturing improvements. Um, 
Next is connectivity. So going beyond the old 3G, 4G to 5G and what will come next to improve how humans and machines can interact with each other. The next is distributed infrastructure. And that's largely about cloud computing and cloud computing you know, might be the most overhyped word in business today or hyped word in business today. But we believe the impact is real. And when combined with edge computing and other infrastructure innovations, we'll have transformational power. Next is next generation computing. This is largely about quantum computing, which is probably a riskier technology bet than some of the others on here, but has the potential to be, in my view, perhaps the most exciting. Next is applied AI, which powers a lot of what was in 1A and 1B and will be accelerated by what's in 3 and 4, but really is about improving computer speech, computer vision, and, and so on. Next is about new programming approaches. It turns out the way we develop software hasn't changed that much in the last 20 years, but is beginning to. So it's worth talking about the impact that could have. Next is about trust and about, um, uh, about managing safety in our connected world. In 2019, there were 8.5 billion data records that were breached uh, online. That's a significant number because that was the first time there were actually more data records than there were people. So on average, your data was breached more than once in 2019. And as that accelerates, we see huge potential from innovating in trust architecture to protect against that. Next is the bio revolution. That's probably the one that needs least explanation as many of us have been benefited from mRNA and other technologies already. Next is next generation materials, whether that's about nanomaterials or whether that's about small, uh, higher strength, lower weight materials. And then finally is clean technologies all the way from at the extreme end to, you know, will nuclear fusion work um, to, uh, to how do we really harness the power of renewables uh, and um, uh, closing the loop in our water supply and so on. So a broad waterfront, and some of these, of course, are interrelated, but together we think that potential is enormous. Wonderful. Rodney, can you talk, give us some examples of the impact of some of these technologies? How are they actually going to change the world as we see it? Sure. Let's, let's click down on the first set, actually, if we want to uh, go forward one more. So we'll start on process automation and process visualization. And I'm going to start with a, a term that I think is not yet in common use, and that is a zettabyte. So a zettabyte is 2 to the power of 70, or that's a 1 with 21 zeros after it. Or another way to think of it is it's, it's about a trillion gigabytes, which is a more familiar number. By 2025, there's going to be 80 zettabytes of data from 50 billion connected devices around the world. So what 1A and 1B are about is about harnessing that information. And it's going to go way beyond telling you where your iPhone is where you lost, when you lost it to actually really being able to fully build simulations of industrial processes. One company has 121 plants around the world linked into one network now that allows for this level of optimization. And then creating digital twins, whether it's a city who's created a digital twin of its water supply to optimize that, or whether it's some of the work we did with an America's Cup sailing boat to optimize the hydrofoil to allow it to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to win the America's Cup, using data to simulate and improve um, uh, from this huge uh, swell of data that's going to be out there, we think can actually lead to the automation and improvement of 50% of today's work activities. Very interesting. And, and, and they're connected, right? So if you let me quickly also touch on some of the others on this page. The future of connectivity. I mean, we're all doing things now in 4G, the pre-3G, we wouldn't have imagined those are things we want to be able to do in a distributed way on our phones. Imagine what's going to happen once 5G can reach up to 80% of the world's population, which we think is not too far off. It's within the planning horizon. And what 5G does is it allows lower power connectivity, faster speed connectivity, and lower latency, as much as 20% faster latency. And to illustrate that, actually, instead of using a business example, I'll use a fun example. There's a sports stadium working with this now that first of all is using it to actually track the crowd, crowd flows and crowd sentiment for safety. 
but is also using it to enable every seat in the stadium to have a 360 degree augmented reality, high definition, instant replay playback capability of the play that's going on on the field. So, you know, that might appeal to you, that might ruin the fun of the stadium, but hopefully it gives a bit of a snippet of what this technology can do. And this technology then relies on the third thing on this page, distributed infrastructure. So cloud today is maybe 20% penetration. We see it going to 75% penetration and being further complemented by edge computing. So that means putting the processing power closer to being where it's used and putting the machine learning algorithms out in a distributed way across the network. And with benefits of this, so far people have largely thought about it as cost reduction. And it is certainly that relative to keeping your own massive old and slow infrastructure. But even more excitingly, we think it's developer productivity. It allows you to actually create and innovate and have your business and your technology teams working together to create previously unimagined things in a much faster and more effective way than today. Oh, Sorry, no. I'm getting carried away here, Eto. You can tell I'm uh, <laughs> it's wonderful. You're very passionate. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting to see. No, that's great. And Eto, on automation, is there any specific outlook for Latin America? Listen, um, labor costs are, in fact, in easy, a lot lower in Latin America and in Brazil than in developed economies. No? But it's not only labor costs that actually drive automation. So we're not going to see a lot of automation here to displace labor. Okay? But what we are indeed going to see a lot of automation to actually improve process quality and improve yields. No? In manufacturing, in mining, in agriculture, we are already beginning to see that. No? So you know, those that think that automation is not going to get to our region are very wrong. This is actually a very real trend, and you know, I think it's going to be rolled out in, in Brazil and in Latin America uh, very fast. No? Glad you mentioned um, automation in uh, agriculture and the food chain. It's all. I was in. Um, Japan, or at least virtually in Japan earlier this week, having a version of this conversation. I want to share two examples from, uh, from that discussion that, uh, that I, I thought were intriguing. Number one is the use of drones to survey fields and understand the pest burden on those fields and actually then come up with customized crop protection and customized seed recommendations that are tailored to the pest burden in that particular area. That I thought was interesting, and that's, you know, that's part of a long-running trend in precision agriculture. But at the other end of the spectrum, I also learned, so the Tokyo fish market, if anyone's ever been to Tokyo, it's one of the tourist highlights is going to this really cool fish market. Uh, it turns out, as everybody knows, I think that Japan has a, a significantly aging population. And for young people, although the fish market is cool for the tourists, the young people don't want to work in the fish market anymore. So there's a company called Tunascope, and what Tunascope has done is it's taken cross-sections of tuna fish, and it's done machine learning on what those cross-sections look like, and it allows you to grade the quality, the sushi quality of those tuna fish based on those photographs. And what it does is it takes the knowledge that was in the head of very seasoned, very senior fish professionals and allow you to automate it. And to, it's not taking away a job because those jobs on the whole were not jobs that young people were chasing. But with the same level of precision that these Japanese master craftsmen could previously get in the fish market, you can now do with this AI scan that I believe can be done on a phone, which I just thought was a, a nice example of a few of these technologies coming together. Amazing, very interesting. Rodney, can we hit some other technologies? Sure, so let's, uh, let's see, let's go forward onto the next page. Um, and let's talk about next generation computing. So I think I mentioned this is one of the, um, uh, the uh, one that is still more of a science experiment. So quantum computing. Um, so quantum computing is taking the principles of quantum physics and using those to come up with better computer chips. Instead of trying to explain how that works, let me just explain the impact from it. So right now, if you're searching through a list of 100 items, on average, in a normal computer, you'll find it when you're halfway through that list. You'll find it on the 50th item. If instead you're using quantum approaches, you'll find it with the square root of that. So you'll find it on the 10th item. So already on a list that small, it's five times faster. On a list billions of times longer than that, it's millions of times faster. 
And that allows you to throw open unimagined applications for what you could do with computing power. So whether it's better financial modeling or whether it is better GPS, um, uh, versions of GPS, whether it's better drug design from being able to better simulate how proteins are going to fold, or actually one of the, I think the most interesting examples is better catalysis design. A huge amount of the world's energy is still used in a pretty basic way, um, creating um, fertilizer, nitrogen containing fertilizer, which is you know a 200 year old, 150 year old harbor process based on a particular catalysis design. There's a belief that quantum computing can substantially improve the efficiency of that by improving the catalysis design, which I like as it's an example of taking sort of one of the oldest industrial things on earth and one of the newer industrial things on earth improving it. But if those things are able to work, we see more than a trillion dollars of value from those quantum computing use cases and lots of different business models for they, the, how they could be put into place. Um, Very applied AI, I think I already talked about. Maybe future of programming is one other I'll hit on this page. So programming has been done in a similar way for the last uh, 20 years. And it was actually, you know, we're just learning about agile and the rest of business now. But Agile really evolved as a, as a programming technology about 20 or it emerged about 20 years ago. So we're ready for what comes next. And what comes next, we believe, is a combination of approaches. First of all, there's a long way you can go with lower code or even no code approaches. And the amount of computing power and simplicity that's being built into off-the-shelf things you can buy is enormous. It's fantastic to graduate from university as a data scientist today, right? The world is knocking on your door to hire you. But so much basic data science is being built into these packages. I think there's an interesting question as to whether it will be data science 10 or 20 years from now, or whether that will be entirely automated and entirely co-opted into these platforms. And many of these platforms will use an approach that we're increasingly calling software 2.0, which is really a new way of building automated production pipelines around machine learning. Well, let me pause there. I could go on more and more about any of these. But what is? Uh, but I, I'm kind of curious there. What is this automated programming that you're describing? How does that work, and how would that apply in a given industry or a given solution? Sure. So let me use it in a machine learning context, right? So you know, the heroes of machine learning so far have been the people who've come up with the clever code, the, the clever algorithms to say, based on this data set. We've looked at the data set and here's a way to find new associations in the data set that we didn't see before. It turns out that while that algorithm part is important, what is just as important is actually the data engineering that leads up to that, that allows you to have a data set that's analyzable. The production pipeline of how all that code fits together and how all that code will roll out into production once it's done. And being able to really build everything from the security around that to the process control around that so you don't get stuck in version updates and so on and so on. And it turns out that while you know the big brain, well, you know, the neuroscientists of it all might be the algorithm developers, there's a lot around creating the repeatable code pipelines that's just as important in productivity. When Netflix, for example, did this, they took their time down to release something new from four months to a handful of days when they were able to automate around the rest and then really allow the, uh, unleash the algorithm developers to do their thing. So really for companies finding ways to come up with much more robust ways of automating everything except the algorithm development and really creating these standardized pipelines, uh, we think is the next frontier to unlock uh, the potential of machine learning. We're really calling it machine learning operations to really how you go from something that's a cottage industry to something that can be industrialized. Very interesting, very interesting. Well, there is no safe place in this with this technology trends. Huh? Can you talk a little bit about the impact for business? <laughs> you know, what are the opportunities and risks that uh, businesses are facing in, the, in light of these changes? So the opportunities, um, I mean, I've hopefully been hitting on a few of them as we've gone. As we've gone. I think it's, uh, it, it, it's tremendous, right? And, you know, there's a very interesting choice that every company is going to face and then in aggregate the economy faces, which is if you think about the productivity potential here, is this twice as much output, same number of people, or is this half as many people, 
today's level of output. And frankly, these technologies, many of them could go either way. We see tremendous potential for twice as many, twice as much output, same number of people. Recognizing the skills of those people are going to need to change and evolve, right? A move towards more technology oriented, more numerate skills, less managerial, less, less layers of management, less traditional administrative skills. But for companies and for economies that can make that shift, we actually see tremendous and hopefully inclusive productivity growth here as it is about getting more out of the same or more people rather than same out of less people. That's probably a very macro answer to your, uh, your, your specific question. But, but also all of this, all of this depends on creating the right trust environment. But let, let me pause there and I can go deep, deeper in trust if you want me to. Ron, what you just described is actually very interesting because when I hear you talk about all these technologies, the f we have this great fear that it's actually going to displace labor and we're going to see huge unemployment. No? But what you see, we see in North America today is actually a tremendous shortage of, of labor. No? Uh, so is this trend actually in play at, at, at present, what you're just describing of actually the value creation is actually creating more opportunities for people rather than less? Yes, so um, I mean, this is a macroeconomics question, probably more than a, a technology question, but let me, let me give you my, uh, my, 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 my amateur view of it. So we are seeing labor shortages uh, in, the, in the US today. Um, arguably, they're very localized labor shortages. And obviously, there's a lot of sort of pandemic or late pandemic noise in that. But I think they might illustrate what's to come about in aggregate, these technologies have tremendous opportunities to create uh, to, uh, to, to, to to create create jobs and to create more growth with less capital deployed. So if you think about one of the most important things that digital can do today, so we're talking about today's digital, not even the futuristic things that are on here. What it allows you to get is greater precision, right? How you can define and narrow your markets even more precisely on which products are going to sell, who is buying your products how to price those products. And companies that are able to harness that level of sort of precision marketing, precision sales technology, are able to get much more growth with not much more capital investment. And that's why, you know, typically we'd be saying now, we're late in a business cycle. This is normally the consolidation stage where you see a lot more M&A, but we're seeing an enormous interest in squeezing out further organic growth enabled by these precision growth technologies. And if those are broadly adopted and those are broadly successful, they're hugely productivity increasing and hugely job creating. What might happen though, is those jobs might be in different locations from where the jobs are today. And I think that's been a significant part of the political disruption in many developed economies. And I believe that, you know, the math says on aggregate, there can be and there will be more jobs than today, but not necessarily in the same skill categories and not necessarily in the same locations which is where the mandate for upskilling and where some of, frankly, the political challenges of managing the transition come into place. Hot tub sales this year, to give you a random statistic, and this is, uh, I think, based on a, a few manufacturers, not maybe a broad number. Hot tub sales this year are up 38%. That's probably a number that nobody would have guessed, right? And you may not follow the hot tub market that closely, but it's an example of if you're really tuned into sort of precision growth opportunities, Picking your markets and your sub-markets um, is going to be a much, uh, much more important and much more powerful lever today uh, than it's been in the past. We are getting a few questions from the audience uh, already, and I'd like to send it to you, Rodney. What's your guidance for business leaders that want to understand how these trends will disrupt their industry and business? Great question. So the best way to understand it. The first thing I would say is look outside your industry. So one of the fun things about, um, about these technologies is we've picked ones that cut across industries, and we think the bigger changes are going to be from things that are these horizontal cross-cutters rather than things that are simply within existing industries. So if you're a business leader who's just spending time on yourselves and on your competitors, you might be missing a learning opportunity. So that would be number one. Number two, and as someone who's passionate about technology, you may think this is hypocritical. I might say, don't get too carried away with any one technology. 
And don't get carried away with taking a technology forward view, right? We don't think it makes sense to say, what should the next generation computing strategy be for my company? Instead, we think you need to start from the value back, right? So understanding where the opportunities are um, domain by domain in your business for the biggest value creation levers. And you have to be inspired by what are the technologies and what are the things that you see others doing. But when you see where the biggest sort of value leaps are possible, then solve back from what are the technologies you can use to help transform those value, to help capture those value opportunities. And how do you create what we call a business-led technology roadmap in contrast to a technology roadmap, a business-led technology roadmap? Rodney, since we are on that topic, we got further questions from the audience uh, about the impact of this, this technology trends in specific industries. No? So for instance, if you're in financial services, if you're a bank, how should be thinking about these this 10 trends, which are mo would be most relevant for your business, for your banking business? No? Uh, or if you are in food services, another sector that we got a question from the audience. So if you can actually hit on those two, would be very nice. Sure, sure. I'll say, so uh, my, my, you mean my, my tuna fish example didn't answer all the questions for the banking industry. <laughs> um, so in banking, a few things, right? So first of all, and, um, and you know, I'll defer to my colleagues, actually my colleagues like you, Eto, who spend more time in, the, in banking than I do. But here's, here's how I would stack rank them. So first of all, distributed infrastructure, right? So the power of unleashing cloud computing in banking is enormous. So I would think that would be top or near top for anybody's list in the banking industry. Um, next, um, enabled by that, I would then put applied AI, right? Whether it's anything from your customer relationships to your credit scoring, to your, uh, to your uh, internal risk and control processes, where you can apply AI to transform what you're doing today with, uh, with, with, with lots of labor and to do it with a higher effectiveness. We think it's an enormous uh, opportunity in that. Uh, we think this trust architecture point about, you know, whether it's blockchain or whether it's something else, but how to really adopt technologies that allow you to check trust without an intermediary are going to be incredibly important and transformational in the banking system. And then I would make a flyer bet, and this depends a little bit on the scale of your bank. It would be more relevant for some than for others. But I would at least understand what's going on in next generation computing, because if quantum computing is able to do what some people say it can do, in terms of better financial modeling, or even more in terms of cryptography, in terms of sort of solving the prime factorization problem, then that will really reinvent the banking system. So that might be sort of the horizon three thing to keep an eye on. And then these other ones would be more the horizon one opportunities. Um, in, um, you mentioned food processing. Food uh, frankly, in any, in any processing opportunity, I would go right to the first trend, right? So that idea of what can you get from all the data, right? The, you know, what's your share of the 80 zettabytes of data that are going to be in your industry? And how can you use that to build a better model of your processes and essentially to optimize? And what's interesting when we've seen companies that have done this optimization, I mean, look, concepts like lean and process improvement and so on have been around forever. And many companies feel as if they've been on the process optimization treadmill for 20 years or more. But there's an enormous difference between optimizing processes one at a time versus being able to build a simulation of your entire business or an entire domain within your business and then optimize that. And that yields significant additional results in our experience. Eito, when we think, we think about Brazil, what are the perspectives for talent development? Interesting. I think before we, we hit on talent development, Denise, maybe we talk about the impact of these technologies in Brazil. Because uh, if we look back to Rodney's initial chart, where he described the Industrial Revolution, he actually mentioned that it started in England, in England and in Manchester. And it took 100 years for that thing to actually hit the rest of the world. So there was a big lag okay, for technologies to spread. That is not the case today. Huh? 
we are talking about, we are seeing the events in, in Brazil just as they unfold everywhere else in the world. No? We talk about blockchain, you know, and the blockchain, the trust architecture revolution, and that is happening in Brazil today. Okay, we talk about 4, 5G, and 5G will actually be rolled out across the world in a record time. So the, the time, the lag between you know, a new technology being introduced in the US or in Europe and actually at reaching Brazil or reaching Africa, reaching all corners of the world, is actually very short. So when we talk about these technologies, you know, we talk about things that are actually going to, as soon as they start having impact in North America, in Europe, in Asia, they're also start going to start having impact here. You know? The description that Rodney made about the, the, you know, the company in the Japan sushi market is not that dissimilar from what we are doing in Peru with clients on salmon, fin salmon fishing. Okay, so. I think our businesses need actually to be very, very aware of these technologies and think through them carefully, okay? So that because there are lots of opportunities for incorporating them quickly in our region, and also there are lots of threats for neglecting them. No? So our banks need to be totally attuned with the four, five points that Rodney just mentioned, for example. No? And, and I think that's at the core, no? okay? And, and if I can piggyback on that, to, to answer your talent question, no? uh, I think that requires the development of these new technologies actually require a different set of, uh, of professionals. No? Uh, Brazil, un unfortunately, okay, over the last years, has produced a lot of lawyers and business people no? and business ad administration students in very few uh, technical professions, professionals, very few engineers, very few mathematicians, very few data scientists, programmers, uh, scientists in, 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 the, in the bio field. So we are going to face a massive shortage uh, of talent, okay? And we have some data actually to illustrate that. And this is the gap between tech talent, okay, the, the expected supply and demand of engineers, designers, and, uh, and data scientists in Brazil over until 2030. Also, no? That's in the next eight years. No? We're going to graduate 1.2 million no? students okay, in those professions over the next eight years. And the demand is going to be 2.3 million for jobs. So we have a gap of about over 1 million professionals in the next few years in Brazil just on technology. No? This is a major challenge for the country. It's a major challenge for business. And uh, I don't know how that relates with what we see in other places. But we as Brazilians, we should actually be very concerned about that. Mm -hmm. Rodney, uh, making a parallel, this is the Brazil situation. How do you see the talent situation across the globe and in North America regarding the different types of professions? Do you see the same challenge? Do you see countries that are in, in better, pos better positioned? So um, these are sobering numbers that you're showing here, but I actually think they're not that different from the global picture, right? And the, uh, the, um, the demand for some of these technical skills is just ballooned and the university systems in most countries have not kept up and many companies are reaching on the, to, out to the same sort of academy companies to try and hire these talents. But let me maybe just add a, just a couple of other nuances to that. So first of all, I think um, what's also missing is general managers that you've, you've got on this page of the technical skill sets. But general managers who are proficient in managing these skill sets and who can incorporate these skill sets into how they do work, right? So the idea of a product owner, right, or a product management professional or a team leader who can incorporate this technology thinking, this technology approach into leading a product team, that's a really scarce skill set. And that person might not be a you know, computer science background and so on, but it's someone who's familiar enough working in an environment with these technologies and tools to be able to get the best out of, uh, out of leaders who have these skills. Or you know, how will this then get supplied sort of with the human dimension? Actually, I'll give you an example here from, from China. Um, this is probably a two or three year old example, but it's, a, it, it's one that I, I always found interesting. So um, food chain security, Right, whether something is 
uh, clean, safe, it is what it says it is, it's not counterfeit and so on, is a concern in many countries and uh, has been a particular concern for a while in, uh, in China. Um, and uh, a company um, uh, led by technologists came up with the terrific idea of a blockchain chicken, right? So how do you know your chicken is safe? You know your chicken is safe if there's actually a blockchain tag on it that you can scan with a QR code and it lets you see the entire life story of that chicken from when it came out of the egg and the farm it was on and so on all the way until it gets to the supermarket shelf when you get it. So consumers would be able to use this blockchain approach to really trust their chickens. Unfortunately, this was an approach that was entirely developed by technologists and gave a very clear, very clever sort of technical view of exactly what happened along the chicken supply chain. But at the end of the day, when consumers got it, they just didn't believe it was their chicken. They thought it was very nice that you could see this video of you know, what happened all along the way. But how do you actually know that that's really, really my chicken? And what they missed was actually sort of the marketing, the consumer insights, sort of the retail element to take what was, I'm sure, a fairly expensive technology development and turn that into something that was really going to have customer value. So, you know, you may think that story is a bit of a tangent, but I use it to make a point. It's actually the confluence of technical skills and um, customer and business skills and general management coming together that's going to be the real shortage, but we think is trainable, but it will take time to train it. Rodney, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to resist asking you this question. You're actually leading McKinsey Digital across the globe. So how do you see our own McKinsey challenge in actually integrating and developing these technical skills and actually creating these managerial capabilities that bring this, integrate everything together in, in a more human and business-oriented way? How is our own journey as McKinsey going on, the, on those dimensions? It's going perfectly. We've had no challenges whatsoever, <laughs> at all, as you're, uh, as you're well aware. Um, so this is a great question. I mean, this is as much a transformation for us as it is, uh, uh, as, 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 as it is for anyone else. And just let me talk about sort of our journey in, um, in artificial intelligence, right, to, uh, to, to illustrate that. So um, we, uh, we were fortunate enough to acquire a boutique firm called Quantum Black uh, about six years ago. Um, that was an artificial intelligence uh, firm that had really been founded on elite sports, right? They helped a team win uh, the Formula One uh, event, spread out into other elite sports, and were beginning to spread beyond sports into business, into pharmaceuticals, into aerospace, and so on at the time which we, uh, which we acquired them. And we've, over the past five or six years, been able to turn Quantum Black into really the backbone of everything we do in machine learning and artificial intelligence at McKinsey. But getting that properly embedded into our teams and having our sort of more traditional business school problem solvers understand how you can take a data first approach rather than a hypothesis first approach has been a real journey in itself. And having people understand that it's not about just showing up with the best example from within your industry, but actually it can be about using approaches and even data pools from across industries can make a big difference. Um, but I think where we're evolving that too is actually away from just talking about um, artificial intelligence towards something that we're beginning to call hybrid intelligence. And in hybrid intelligence, we mean the best of AI and machine learning, and then the best of human intelligence and wisdom and insights from within an industry and within a functional domain. And it's really that hybrid intelligence is where the value uh, um, where the value moments really happen. And I think that's been the learning for us of how to sort of evolve towards that point. We have a few, here a few questions from the audience. The first one I'm gonna send to you, Rodney. We've gotten a great question. What trend do you think overall will have the biggest impact on business? So I will give you one safe bet and one wild card. So my safe bet is going to be machine learning. I think what we can do with computer vision, with, um, uh, with speech analytics and with text analytics is just unbelievable. And if you're not already deeply applying machine learning within your business, there's tremendous potential to do so. And I would add to that, it's actually, what we've learned about machine learning is in any business, there's never one sort of killer application. It's not about like, what's the one clever thing I can use it for. It's actually a portfolio. And we found companies are really getting sort of the value unlock from it 
once there are 10 or 11 different use cases of machine learning, often concentrated within one or two domains. So I would put that one first. And you know, some might say, well, that's kind of a, that's here and now, right? That's a mature one. And what we would say is wave one of that is here and now, but this is something we're gonna be talking about for the future of our careers in business. I think the potential of machine learning enabled by this hybrid intelligence concept, I think is enormous. That's maybe my number one. And then my wild card, my wild card is quantum computing, right? If quantum computing can live up to its promise in a timeline that is, you know, within 10 years, not within 30 years, then how we think about encryption, how we think about financial modeling is going to have to be completely rewritten. I have another question here. I'm not sure to who I'm going to send it, but it's... What's the set of competence necessary to leaders in order to navigate in the new technology trends? Well, that is, that's a difficult question, so I'll defer to Rodney. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, the first one is humility, right? No one's going to get this right first. So being able to approach this with an open mind and a willingness to experiment, right? That would be, that would be uh, number one. Uh, number two is... Um, a passion for talent development and capability building, right? We've actually seen many companies struggle to adopt these new technologies when they followed a too heavily outsourced or heavily vendored model. This has to be about building your own skill set and really about building the hybrid intelligence organization, not about what's the one or two things that you can buy from the outside. So approaching this with humility, approaching this as a capability building journey. And then I think deeply understanding your business um, and where those value disruption opportunities are. So you're approaching this in a value back way. Um, you know, it's, it, it's interesting, but we, um, we did a session on this recently with board chairs in North America, right? And the question was, as a board chair, how can you best add value on digital? And their first concern was that they didn't know enough about technology to, uh, to, to, to add value. Um, but then as we sort of got into it further, what we realized was actually their biggest risk was not paying enough attention to the human elements of this, right? Making sure the companies had a talent and capability roadmap that was as detailed as their technology roadmap was one of the ways that they felt uh, boards could, uh, could best add value on this question. Ito, one final question. How relevant do you think these tech trends will be for Brazilian companies and for all of us here? It is, as I said before, I think these trends are actually going to arrive in Brazil very, very fast. Okay, we're going to be in, in the movie, in the dance, just like in the US, companies are in the US, in Europe. So uh, I think businesses and all of us, we need to be very aware and pay a lot of attention of, for what is going on, okay? And, uh, and that brings a lot of implications. We need uh, companies, as Rodney said, and, and leaders that actually you know, are humble, are willing to experiment, are open to learning, I look, are looking at other industries, and actually, frankly, are enjoying the ride because you know, <laughs> these things actually do bring a lot of benefits and, and, and they are great fun. No? Uh, <laughs> Uh, and I went where, I, where we began. I think the things that when we look at our, our iPhone and what e-commerce is doing and video conferencing and so on, which I think are things I could never imagine okay, 20 years ago, they actually make our lives better, okay? And, and we enjoy them a lot. No? So, <laughs> so I look forward to actually seeing, you, you know, what surprises these new trends are going to bring us. Yeah, you're right. So thank you very much, Rodney. Muito obrigada. Thank you, Heitor, for being here with us today. And eu queria também agradecer a todo mundo que enviou suas perguntas, todo mundo que ficou aqui os últimos 45 minutos com a gente. Passar, esses minutos passaram super rápido, foi muito interessante estar aqui nessa sessão hoje. Para conhecer a agenda completa do McKinsey Talks, vá a mckinseytalks.com, lá vocês têm acesso às sessões anteriores e na segunda-feira essa de hoje vai estar lá disponível. A gente também coloca disponível é, no Spotify, né? Toda, todo nosso todo nosso portfólio. Então, todas as sessões também estão disponíveis para você no Spotify, para quem gosta de podcast, é uma ótima. Então, muito obrigada, obrigada a todos, um bom fim de semana e até a próxima.